And we're live. We're live, guys. Welcome to another episode of Good Morning Liberty. My name is Michael Bolden. Today is Wednesday. It is 9.30 a.m. Pacific time here on the West Coast. We're broadcasting from the 10th Amendment Center here in my home office from downtown Los Angeles. So West Coast time, good morning to you. If you're watching somewhere else, good afternoon or good evening. September the 12th, 2018. I really appreciate you being here with me today. Now, today I'm going to cover, oh, I always seem to forget this because I'm still a rookie. <laughs> Make sure if you are supporting our work here, the work here at the 10th Amendment Center, uh, these live streams, these Good Morning Liberty shows, smash that like button. When you do that, it tells YouTube to show it to other people. And also hit subscribe if you want to get notifications of when we go live or when we upload videos. We generally are live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And then we also upload at least one other video per week, uh, generally two to three minutes, either Mike Meharry or myself. Uh, and then plus every one to three weeks this time of year, Mike and I do a longer form show anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour called... 10th or Tuesday, we've done about 40 episodes, though, during the state legislative sessions when there is a lot more nullification stuff happening. That's It starts getting going around November, uh, but the sessions start really in where bills get filed in November and December in some states, but the sessions really get going from January through April. Not the Jeff sessions, but... Uh, so we tend to do that show much more often. We'll probably even do it weekly if we don't run out of time. Now today, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you're here, Alan. I'm going to be, uh, right after this show, I'm going to be recording an episode of The Gold Standard with Alan Mosley. So let's, uh, let's pull that up. I'm going to put this in the link so you guys can find a little bit later on. He had the uh, great Tom Woods on last week for episode 32. I guess, uh, you know, you go from one week to the next, it's not always as awesome. So episode 33 might be okay. We'll see. We'll see. But <laughs> keep an eye out for that. I'll definitely post a link here to Alan's show, the goldstandardpodcast.com, in the show notes. And then I'll also probably post the uh, a link to it or embed the, uh, the YouTube of our conversation on uh, the 10th Amendment Center blog sometime in the next couple of days. Uh, this depends on how quick I am on that. I also want to mention that I'm going to be down in Dallas, Texas. I've got a few other interviews in, be in between. but So today on the gold standard and uh, in November, uh, on November the 10th, it's a Saturday, I'm going to be speaking at an event hosted by the Abbeville Institute. Uh, Don Livingston was very kind to reach out to me to participate in this. I'm going to be covering the state of the nullification movement. Uh, Jeff Deist, uh, head of the Mises Institute, is going to be there as well, uh, talking about political decentralization. I believe Brian McClanahan will be there. Dan Fisher from Oklahoma. A number of people are going to be there. It's not a cheap event, but it should be really good. Dallas is an easy place to get in and out of if you're not in Texas and you're traveling. But uh, we're talking about nullification, decentralization, and they're going to have a number of uh, scholars talking about secession as a way to uh, push back on the, um, on the behemoth monster state. So today, okay, so those two events, I wanted to quick uh, get a little house cleaning out of the way. But uh, today, I want to talk about jury nullification. There's a really interesting report over at Fee. It's one of the websites I look at early in the morning every day. Fee, antiwar.com, Mises Institute, uh, lewrockwell.com, plus Twitter, because you never know who's sharing what <laughs> over there. But there's a really interesting report over at Fee by Brittany Hunter, who also writes... Uh, over at my friend's, my friend Hunter's website, Center for Individualism. CFI is another really good site if you haven't subscribed to that. But she is, uh, her article came out yesterday, September 11th, Nullify Drug War, Empower Juries, Save Lives, all in a day's work for this heroic defense attorney. She's covering reports. This has been going on for a little bit, a little while now. Uh, a lady named Catherine Bernard, she's an attorney in Georgia. And uh, she is actually putting into practice jury nullification and protecting people. And some people might call jury nullification, this is what I generally refer to it, as basically the last line of defense. Now, if you're talking about nullifying stuff when there's so much that needs to be nullified, 
you really have to think of a, a kind of a complex strategy. If you just want to pass some state law and say, oh, well, the state's going to stop it, and you just rely on the states, you're going to be in kind of trouble. We, we've seen this happen on the Real ID Act. This was uh, pushed into uh, law by George Bush and the Republicans. It's basically a national ID card. It violates privacy. It violates the 10th Amendment. It's an unfunded mandate. On and on and on. There are very, there's a number of reasons why the Real ID Act is really bad. But it was supposed to go into effect in 2008, but starting in 2007, New Hampshire, Utah, and a number of other states started passing resolutions and laws opposing it and flat out defying, uh, saying that they wouldn't implement it. And because it was a mandate on the states, if the state simply just didn't implement it, then there's not much that the feds could do. So people thought this was really good, and I think, a lot, and myself included, we all kind of just sat back on it. We saw about two dozen states do this, and we sat back and just kind of let it ride without thinking that, oh, okay, if you're just relying on state bureaucrats to nullify a federal law without any follow-up pressure, they're going to end up flipping. And uh, we've seen this all across the country. There are still a number of states like Montana, maybe Utah, that are not Real ID compliant and are being threatened over and over by DHS. They've had this happen for years. But a lot of the states who weren't compliant actually flip-flopped. So Governor Butch Otter of Idaho is a great example. This so-called conservative Republican when uh, the Real ID Act, when he signed this law opposing the Real ID Act, I believe it was when Obama was in office, he signed a bill that says it was inimical to liberty and the state of Idaho would not participate in it. And then just a few years later, Obama was still in office. It may have been last year when Trump came in. I should actually look to see if it was that kind of a partisan thing or not. I don't think so. I think he's just bad. But over, after a few years, this thing that was inimical to liberty that he signed suddenly was something that the state had to, to implement. So we saw this happen in Kansas, I believe, and a number of other states where they just kind of flip-flop. So the idea of relying on government to do things is not a uh, government alone. Sometimes they can play a part, and they certainly can be uh, chess pieces in this overall grand strategy. But oftentimes, they're just not reliable. They're bad as well. There's a lot of people in government who believe in government as a solution to all the problems, and they have a bad foundation, so they are unreliable and untrustworthy. Um, but jury nullification is incredibly important, and Dakota, thank you for stopping by after reading Spooner's essay on it. I've, I should actually dig out the link for that and put it in as well. I've, I've come away with the notion that it is our last line of peaceful or civil resistance against tr tyranny, and jury nullification absolutely is, and that's what I'm, I'm getting to this roundabout way, talking about the Real ID Act. If you just rely on the state, the state will often falter. If you just rely on individual civil disobedience, in essence, uh, so for example, before uh, Prop 215 legalizing medical marijuana here in California was passed in uh, 1996, people were already doing business in this plant without permission from state law. But when you just rely just on individual action, there's also risk. And that's why jury nullification is so important, because it is the last line of defense. Once all these other methods have failed somebody, and they do. All strategies fail people, even if it's the most effective way that I would say of pushing back and undermining government power. There are times people get caught up in the system. So when someone gets caught up in the system and for a nonviolent act, for a choice that government has decided to make illegal, their anti-choice positions, their laws, their prohibitions, whether it's on a gun or a plant, well, that person gets arrested, thrown in a cage, locked up, their liberty taken away and put on trial. Well, who can save that person? The jury, a jury of their peers. And that's exactly what's happening with Catherine Bernard in, uh, in, in her work in Georgia. The most recent case is a lady named Giovanni Mondrea McCoy. And here's from Brittany's report, which is really good. When Giovanni stood before the jury and admitted to growing, oh, it's a man, I apologize. When Giovanni stood before the jury and admitted to growing marijuana in his home, the last thing the prosecution expected was a verdict of not guilty. Mind you, he literally stood there in court and said, yes, I broke the law. But 
as Brittany goes on, it was precisely McCoy's willingness to be so forthcoming that ultimately left the jury unwilling to sentence him to spend years behind bars. Here's how he put it. He says, yep, it was mine. I used it as medicine. He was a victim of a brutal attack. He's grown up in a poor area. He's had a hard time getting a job. He decided to use cannabis. It's illegal under Georgia law. It is illegal under federal law. He still did it anyways. So this tells us the power of the jury to protect people, the last line of defense. Brittany goes on. When McCoy's attorney, Catherine Bernard, first addressed the jury, she reminded them of the wonderful opportunity they had before them in deciding this case. As members of the jury, they play a very important role in our legal system, one that Bernard calls a powerful and awesome position. Now, she actually refrains from using the term jury nullification. I don't know. A lot of people are frightened of the term. I know that the legal system has been very aggressive against it. So maybe she's making a strategic choice. Maybe she doesn't like the term. Uh, Maybe she thinks it's a tarnished term. Maybe, I don't know, maybe she doesn't agree with it. I don't know why she doesn't use a term. But she generally avoids using it. But what she's advocating for is absolutely jury nullification. And it's part of the Georgia state constitution. I didn't realize this. So as I'm reading this report, and I saw this covered in Reason and a number of other places over the summer, it's covered explicitly protected under Georgia law, under Article 1, Section 1, Paragraph 11 of the Georgia state constitution. It reads, quote, the jury shall be the judges of the law and the facts. And that is what jury nullification is. So the short version is judging the law and the facts. So you can convict someone of violating the facts. The facts of the case say that this person violated this law that's on the book in this city, state, or country, whatever it may be. And that's judging the facts of the case. The letter of the law says this, and this person says this. And now here in Georgia, Giovanni says, hey, I did it. But here's why. Now, that's judging the law. They're basically saying that applying a guilty verdict will have an unjust result in this situation. And in fact, I would argue in most situations, especially when it comes to nonviolent crime, if you haven't harmed anybody, no victim, no crime is the message. You haven't harmed anybody. Why should you be locked in jail for making a choice for yourself? Because maybe somewhere down the line you might. That's thought crime, and that is extremely dangerous. So this is in the Georgia state constitution. It's been there a long time. And as Brittany reports, the judge doesn't like you saying that. And this is what they do across the country when you try to do these types of things. When Bernard read this aloud to the jury prior to McCoy's trial, the judge cut her off and tried to say she was misinterpreting it. But Bernard, who was the Georgia contact for the Fully Informed Jury Association, FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org. I always recommend when people ask us about jury notification, we're learning more and more about it here and doing more coverage on it, as you can see right here. Uh, But we generally refer people to FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org. They are the experts in this. So the judge cuts her off says she's misinterpreting it, even though it says the jury shall be judges of the law and the facts. Just straight out, pretty clear. She continued to tell the jury anyways. He cuts her off, says she's misinterpreting it, and she said, look, it's here in the state constitution, and this is what she told Reason for the report, and I love this. He told me I couldn't say it, so of course I continued to say it. And that's really the courage that's needed from people, whether it's an attorney reminding jurors of their duty to judge the law and the facts, or a, an attorney in Georgia just reminding them what the state constitution says that they can do. Or as Robert Scott Bell, my good friend who does the Robert Scott Bell show, uh, he's a natural health expert. He focuses primarily on health freedom, on treating yourself with a uh, in ways that the FDA may not say is okay for you. And he says, stop asking for permission where none is required. So when it's a choice about your own body like this, why would you wait for government to tell you, okay, well, you can't use that as medicine if you don't want to. 
So Catherine Bernard, hero. They said you can't talk about this, and she does it anyways. And then they decided to acquit because they said his circumstances were so powerful and that he shouldn't be in jail for using this plant to treat his pain. Now, as I was doing this, I didn't realize that this was in the state constitution. So I started doing some Googling yesterday, and I found that there are a, a few other states, mostly for libel, that include things either in law or in the state constitution uh, referring to uh, jury nullification. But a few of them actually have it more broadly, like Georgia does. Here's the Georgia one again. It's paragraph 11, right to trial by jury, number of jurors, selection and compensation. It says the right to trial by jury shall remain inviolate, except that the court shall render judgment, blah, blah, blah. Jury shall be the judges of the law and the facts. And that's, that's the bottom line. They're choosing whether the law is just. But they're not alone. Here in Maryland, Article 23 of the state, I think it's like the Declaration of Rights, says, in the trial of all criminal cases, the jury shall be the judges of law as well as of fact. That's amazing. Again, law and fact. Also in Indiana, Section 19, also I believe of their Bill of Rights, in all criminal cases, whatever, every case, any criminal case at all, the jury shall have the right to determine the law and the facts. And in Oregon, section 16, in all criminal cases, whatever, the jury shall have the right to determine the law and the facts under the direction of the court as to the law and the right of new trial as in civil cases. So the law and the facts. And our friend Rob Taylor, who is working, you may have heard me cover a few weeks ago, Second Amendment preservation ordinance effort in Eastern Oregon. They're working to create gun rights sanctuary counties where they will no longer enforce state or federal gun laws that restrict the right to keep and bear arms, so all of them. So they're working to get these passed by ballot measure. And Rob has been leading the effort amongst many other people. But Rob also works on jury nullification. As I'm doing this research, I was like blown away that this was happening in Oregon because last year there was a jury nullification bill filed in Oregon. So I'm thinking to myself, Man, I must. I know Mike Meharry did most of the coverage on this. He does most of the reporting for our for our uh, bill reports. So does T.J. Martinell. And I'm thinking, well, what was the point of filing this if it's already in the state constitution? And it turns out, and I found found uh, an article that Rob actually wrote explaining this. And basically, what the bill was doing was not trying to make jury nullification the law of the land in Oregon because it already is, but to require the judge to inform the people of this. So. In a situation like what's happening with Catherine Bernard, and the same type of thing has been happening in New Hampshire. So when you have a person like Catherine Bernard, an attorney uh, in Georgia, wanting to inform the jury of their right and duty to judge not just the facts of the case, but the law itself, whether they vote guilty or not guilty, and the court itself, the judge right there is saying, no, no, attorney, you're full of garbage. Well, that's going to, unless she makes a really good case, and she's actually said it's much easier for her in small town because she has been able to, I guess, to appeal to their humanity or something. Maybe us big city people are just creeps and we don't listen. I don't know. Maybe there's a different jury selection or maybe life in a small town, and I don't live in one, so maybe there's a, just a connection to the community that's stronger there. So for whatever reason, she's had better success explaining this, but she's still having to fight judges who are telling her, you're not allowed to do this. And that's why it's important to get this type of legislation. So follow-up legislation in Oregon, if the judge says, yes, your attorney is correct, you do, you, this is your, your, your right to do this, and you may do choo choose to judge the law itself or just the facts of the case. Now, if the judge says that, it holds a lot more credence to most people. Now, to me, the guy in a robe really doesn't hold a lot of credence on much, uh, but that, uh, that adds some weight. 
Now, there's legislation that uh, Dan Itza and a number of other people in New Hampshire have been working on because there is a jury nullification law, not in the state constitution, in New Hampshire that judges have been kind of going around it. And basically, you're creating this conflict where the attorneys are saying it and the judge is basically debating with them in front of the jury. So what's a jury, jury going to do? They're probably going to think, oh, well, of course, this defense attorney is just trying to protect uh, their client, mm, they make a pretty good case. But if the judge is telling me this is bull, why would I believe it? So there's a much greater chance of jury nullification being swept to the side when the judges aren't being honest and the judges are not. So Brian actually, Brian Hickman asks a really important question. In such a case where a law is found to be unjust, would the law be removed from the books or would the jury nullification only apply to the applicable case? It's the latter, actually. So it only applies to the individual case. But as we learned in the Fugitive Slave Act days, this is the 1850s, in places like Syracuse, New York, Albany, New York, Ohio, they had such a hard time convicting that Think of it just the reverse of, of what the, the scenario I was describing. So if the judge is debating with the attorney, then the jurors are going to be less likely. Well, if the prosecutors realize that every case keeps getting overturned with jury nullification, they're going to be less likely to bring some of the cases. So in practice, it's very important. But this also brings awareness. So maybe in Georgia, where they've been trying to pass a medical marijuana law for a few years, maybe this can be seen as a rallying cry. Like, look, this guy, the jury let him off because a jury of his peers said that he really wasn't doing anything wrong. The law itself is bad. So now that's getting out to the public that the law is bad and it can be kind of a reverse nullification starting with the jury. But yes, it is only to the specific case and it does require really dedicated attorneys willing to be lambasted by the courts because they just do. Now, in Montana a few years ago, again, it's marijuana. I would like to see the same thing happen uh, on guns. Uh, we know there was a form of jury nullification that happened with the Bundys. We've got a blog on that that I should have really pulled up for today, but I didn't. But uh, maybe we'll cover that sometime in the future. But the Bundys were released, in essence, on at least in my view, on jury nullification. Some people would say it wasn't, but I think it was a clear-cut case of jury nullification. This can be applied to just about anything. And the more that it happens, the less likely that people are going to get prosecuted in general, the more that it puts in the public sphere. Hey, if the juries keep throwing these cases out, why are we try wasting all this money enforcing these laws? So that's going to be kind of the discussion that goes forward. So in Montana, a number of years ago, as I was saying, there was a, a just a, I guess this is a bad word, this propaganda. It was a rash of jury nullification. I shouldn't repeat that because it sounds so negative. There was a run of jury nullification on marijuana cases. They just could not, and I forget what city it was, but they could not seat a jury over and over and over to convict anyone for nonviolent marijuana crimes. What are you going to do? This is a very powerful defense because they can't even, like, once the jury turns in that verdict, like, they can't do anything. They do all these things to basically stop attorneys. They arrest people who hand out flyers to talk about jury nullification. They basically try to shut down free speech. If you're a FIJA activist in New York City, for example, handing out flyers saying you have the right to judge the law and the facts, what is here's what this means. It is very likely you will be arrested for doing that, for jury tampering. But they don't see it as jury tampering to hide that information from them. Of course, when it comes to government, it's always a double standard. So over in the chat, hello over to Michael Woodsider. Good to see you. Uh, Michael says, judges seem to want to control the outcome rather than fairly decide what evidence is pre presented. Yes, and they actually... They just want the law enforcement. That's that's kind of the mentality of law enforcement. They're not thinking about justice. These are supposed to be justices. And if a jury has made a decision, that's the whole process. If, you, if you've if gone through the trouble to pull people away from their lives, give them $15 a day to serve on this jury, and they're there, they've, got, they've gotten picked, uh, they haven't been disqualified, and they're there, and they say, no, 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 there's this... Even though I agree that the law was violated, this law is bad. Well, that's the system. 
And that's how you really defeat a tyrannical government. This is the last line of defense, as Dakota put it. Woodsider, again, going back to Brian's question, I believe it stays on the books, but it builds a case history against it, absolutely. And that's a much better way of explaining it than my long rambling version of it. Dakota says, I think it applies to the case at hand and it would really take several. So it really what we're talking about is nullification in practice. So in that city in Montana, I'll have to look up which one it was. If they just keep nullifying in the jury, then at some point you build this confidence that no one's going to be able to prosecute. So that is kind of the process there. So really good things happening on this. We actually did uh, in our nullify season two which came out in late 2016. We did a, a, a chapter on jury nullification called The Last Line of Defense. Uh, we've done a number of articles on this, covering it over time, and I really think it's, a, a, it's an incredibly important thing that we've just kind of avoided just because there's experts out there, Fija. But if, we're not, if we talk about smart strategy, and this is something that I do all the time, if we're not including jury nullification as a piece of that pie, I think we're missing something. So our annual State of the nullif Nullification Movement report, it's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. It's still the 2017 report, but I think we should really, we're going to probably, or we should, I don't know, <laughs> Mike and I will probably be doing some writing on this in the next couple of months to get it out by the end of the year or early 2019 for the 2018 up, updated annual report, but I really think we should start including this because even though we don't have a lot of legislation, because that generally covers legislation, we have the first section of it that talks about just the principle and the strategy, but the second part that covers the major moves in legislative activity, whether it's states trying to undermine asset forfeiture or surveillance or whatever it may be, gun control, etc., or local communities like up in eastern Oregon. But if even though we don't have a lot of legislation that's moved forward on jury nullification, it might be good to just include this as part of the overall strategy. Because if we're covering it and tens of thousands of people read this over time, they're going to say, well, how do I implement nullification? Well, jury nullification is part of it. Why is this not in my state constitution? Because we can list the states that have it. I think this is a complete list, uh, but that was as of 2001. So it's just going to take a little bit more research. I'll probably have to just reach out to, to Fija and find out. Now, I don't have a quote of the day today. So I'm just going to I'm going to randomly go to Google, see what I can pull up. Oh, I like this one. Samuel Adams, one of my favorites. The Father of the American Revolution was a great book if you want to read it. And he basically said, and this is paraphrase, it is our duty to defend our Constitution and liberty against all attacks, all of them, not just once in a while, but all the time. Twitter does not lay out properly. So I'll just, the liberties of our country, the freedom of our civil constitution are worth defending at all hazards, and it is our duty to defend them against all attacks. Jury nullification is certainly part of that. So state and individual level nullification. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Alan Mosley, I'm going to be on the gold standard with you here in a few minutes. I'm going to have to go get some coffee to reload. Dakota, I really appreciate you being by uh, and uh, your information on getting uploaded to BitChute. Things are going well there. We're also expanding our effort over at Minds.com. We've been doing a lot of outreach over on Minds.com, which is an Ethereum-based Ethereum uh, social media platform. Uh, hello to uh, Brian, Michael, Woodsider, Scouse Jack. Quote of the day. <laughs> this is great. This will get you banned from YouTube, Michael. Well, eventually it's going to happen. So that's why I'm already working on building up our accounts over at uh, BitChute and Real.Video plus Minds.com and elsewhere. We're going to continue doing this. But as long as YouTube turns a blind eye and we continue doing what we're doing, we are, will continue advocating, nullifying all illegal, immoral, unconstitutional acts as long as they can. Our goal is to reach more people. You help us do that when you hit the like button, smash the like button, subscribe to get updates, share this, and of course, if you really, really are on board, join us, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members for as little as two bucks a month. I really appreciate you being here with me today. I hope you learned something. I'm learning a lot on jury nullification. I think it's important that I learn more. A lot of people look to me, Mike Meharry, and many others on, um, 
on nullification as being kind of the go-to people. Even when people reach out to Tom Woods on legislative efforts, now he understands the theory and the history, but he will all often, and he has for years, he just refers them over to us here at the 10th Amendment Center. So we really need to get better on this, and uh, I think this is going to be part and parcel of the whole process. But thank you for, for joining us. I hope you have a great Wednesday. We'll be back here on Friday morning, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time with some uh, interesting stories. And, of course, the ignorant comment of the week is really always fun. Of course, I hope you have a great Wednesday, and we'll see you next time.